Hi, Abbey Church. It's Chris Kandaya here. It's lovely to join you, albeit digitally. This is the way we have to do things right now. I'd much rather be with you face to face, not just because my sister-in-law, Susie, her husband, Matt, and Roxy and Leo, my two nieces, are there, and it'd be so nice to see you. But I've enjoyed over the years spending time with Stuart and the rest of the leaders and the church. So thanks for inviting me back. I don't know how you're coping with this new phase of lockdown. The best way I can think about it is I go for a little run most mornings. I'm totally rubbish as a runner. I have to run really early in the morning so nobody else can see me and I've never been in a competitive event. I'm too embarrassed. But at the end of my circuit that I run, I'm normally dead tired and I just fall on the floor uh, exhausted. But imagine having completed my circuit, there's a man standing at my front door with a sign that says, you need to run another lap in brackets, maybe two or three more, and you can't come back inside until you've finished. And this time it's raining and it's windy and it's snowing. And that's how this phase of lockdown feels right now. We kind of coped up to now, but the long haul, and we're not quite sure how long it's gonna be, has been quite tough, hasn't it? And I want to encourage you that loads of people are feeling like that, if that's you right now. And God's church is one of the ways we combat that fatigue. We were designed to be part of a church family. And the church family, in, in my little illustration, could be like those little water tables that you have uh, by the side of marathons. You know, as the marathon runners are running and running and running, they grab a quick water in order to keep going. And us coming together like this for, for worship, for prayer, for Bible teaching, for seeing one another, I know it's not as good as face to face, but it, it's like those little water grabs. It's something to keep you going. So well done for coming to this service today. I hope it's a help. I hope it's a blessing to you. Now, I love the fact that you've got a little series running on transformation. Often when we think about preaching, it's just the transfer of information. But now we're talking about the informing of transformation. That's what we want. We want to hear what God has to say to us. And we want it to fix and empower and inspire and encourage us to live well for God in the world. So we're talking about transforming relationships. And I guess that's the fun way of thinking about the entire big picture of the Bible. I'm not just going to take a few verses from the Bible and say, look, the Bible cares about friendship. Look at the book of Proverbs or the Bible cares about marriage. Look at Ephesians chapter five. No, I want to give you a bigger frame of reference to understand relationships. So then we might understand how God is currently transforming our relationships. And particularly because lockdown has been hard for us, uh, particularly if you're on your own and you might feel particularly isolated. My daughter's gone to university and she started university in lockdown. And it's weird. It, you know, those student parties that are going on outside, she doesn't want to be part of that. And yet she's finding it really difficult to make friends because she only has one hour of face to face lectures a week. All the rest is going on the Zoom. And so her and a lot of students are finding life quite isolating. And so as we talk about relationships today, um, I want this to be an encouragement to you. I want you to feel hope in your relationships, even if you're feeling lonely right now. And I know it's not just students that feel like that. I know that particularly elderly people who might live on their own have been feeling like that. So again, I hope this is a message of hope and encouragement to you. And you leave our time together feeling that God cares about you and he cares about your relationships. I wanna start by thinking about the gospel. When I grew up, I was given a presentation of the gospel that had a little diagram and the diagram had me on one side and God on the other side. And between us, there was a massive gap. And that gap was called sin. And Jesus came along and he was like the bridge between my side and God's side so that we could have a relationship with him. And right from the beginning of my understanding of the Christian faith, I was told that Christianity is all about a relationship with God. And I want to say it is 
but that's just the beginning of what Christianity is all about. And I want to give you a bigger frame of reference by starting in a different place. So, you know, when we talk about you on one side and God on the other side um, and the gap between us being sin, that's referred to in Genesis chapter three. And that's sometimes known as the fall of humanity. It's when things began to go badly wrong. But you might have guessed that from the title, Genesis chapter three is the third chapter of the Bible. In other words, there's two more chapters before then. So what did Genesis 1 and 2 have to say about God's plans for us and particularly our relationships? So if you were to think about Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, it talks like this. It says, um, let us make man in our image. And then it says male and female, he created them. There's a whole bunch of things there that tell us something important about our relationships. Firstly, God is a relational God. So God says, let us. And now he could be using the royal we, you know, like the queen does. We must be having tea. We must look after the corgis. Or this could be a way of signaling a truth that becomes clearer, particularly in the New Testament, that God is in relationship. Christians believe that God is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. You might have seen people on films or in, in other traditions, they, they do this, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. They're crossing themselves to say that my identity as a Christian is tied up with the fact that God is Trinity. And that means Christians think that God is three persons, but one being. We don't believe in three different gods. We believe in one God, but in three persons. So God is relational in his very being. God is living in perfect relationship with himself. God the Father loves God the Son, and God the Father and the Son love the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit loves the Father. It's, it's all interpenetrating relationships. God love, God is love. That's what it means when you pick that up in 1 John. God doesn't need us in order to love because he already has himself. He has Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And what's amazing is that God deliberates. He says, let us make man in our image, male and female, he created them. So God is, is designing human life to be in relationship with him so we were designed for a relationship with god that's point two so when it says we're made in the image of god it's a little bit like the relationship that a photograph do you remember those old polaroid cameras where you took a photo and immediately it spat out a physical photo well that photograph has a relationship with the object of which the photo was taken, you know, that photograph doesn't make sense if the object of which it took was taken doesn't exist. So human life only makes sense if there is a God, because by our very being, we were made in the image of God. Another way of thinking about this is in the ancient world, if, if a king conquered a new territory um, to let everybody know who was king, that king might set up a statue of himself in the town square or in the capital city so that all the citizens would know who was king and God when he made the universe from nothing the image that he set up of himself not in the town square but on planet earth was not made of marble or plaster or concrete it was made of flesh it was us we were supposed to be the way in which the universe remembered who God was. And so our job was to demonstrate the family likeness. We were supposed to show what God was like in all the ways that we dealt with people, in all the ways that we interacted with the universe. That was our job. And so in the beginning, God creates human beings in his image. But it says male and female, he created them. So. The weird thing is some Christians think that it's only a relationship with God that is needed in order to live a full life. But actually that's not what the Bible says. You see, the first thing that the Bible records as being not good is when God says in Genesis 1, it is not good for man to be alone. Now you might say, well, man wasn't alone 
man had a relationship with God but God says it's not good enough man was not just created for a personal relationship with God man was also created for friendships for love for teamwork for family for romance we were created to relate to others that's why it says it's not good for man to be alone and when when he uses the word man he's meaning human beings because there was no gender right there was only one being and then the way the bible describes it um and again doesn't really matter at this stage whether you think it's a metaphor or uh, exact history you know we can agree to disagree on that but human beings became um relational when adam and eve were made well eve was made from from adam and then uh, in that first relationship is kind of focusing on on romance and and um procreation and, and children being born uh, and that makes sense for the narrative but still the principle that it's not good for us to be alone that we were created for other people um, and to live an authentic human life we need relationships with other people they don't have to be romantic hear this jesus was single and he's the most authentic human being that's ever existed um, and, and some people feel that, you know, unless they're married, they're somehow lesser. Well, that can't be true because Jesus is the finest, most perfect human being that ever lived and ever will live. And yet he was fully human in all of its richness without marriage. So please don't let anyone tell you that you're somehow inferior or don't feel like that if you're not married. Um, so but we were related created for relationship and Jesus had all sorts of amazing friendships and partnerships and and you know family relationships that, were, that, that enriched his life so we were created for a relationship with God and we were created for a relationship with other people and that relationship is built into the two greatest commands the Bible tells us love the Lord your God with all your heart mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself so that that command underlines another relationship, doesn't it? We were created for a relationship with God. Love the Lord your God. We were created for a relationship with your neighbor and a neighbor could be your physical neighbor, the person that lives next door. Or it could be your moral neighbor, the person that you have responsibility for. But it also says love your neighbor as you love yourself. So you were created for a relationship with yourself. And if you go back to the Genesis account, those first human beings, they were kind of comfortable in their own skin. They uh, didn't look in the mirror and say they were too fat or too thin or black or white or old or young. They, they were just comfortable with who they were. That was God's intention for human flourishing. But there's one last relationship I want to include as, it, as the Genesis 1 and 2 uh, works its way out. We were created for a relationship with God created for a relationship with others, created for a relationship with ourselves, but also we were supposed to have a relationship with our world, with our place, with our universe. And we were given meaningful work to do. Uh, you know, it talks about uh, Adam and Eve naming the animals. There was a kind of relationship with nature there that we were to rule over the creation and some people go oh no rule that sounds horrible it sounds like it's going to be exploitative it sounds like we're going to rape the earth no we're supposed to rule in the same way that god rules the universe because we are made in the image of god so people are supposed to look at the way we were caring for creation and think our god is a compassionate loving gracious god because of the way that we've been stewarding looking after creation and so, you know, we were supposed to name the animals. In Genesis, it says that there were gold and precious things hidden in the lands around uh, where Adam and Eve were placed. There was good fruit in the tree. They were supposed to cultivate and farm. Uh, there was supposed to be meaningful engagement with the world. And they were supposed to do that as a partnership, Adam and Eve working together. And so that relationship with our place really matters. God didn't create Adam and Eve to kind of spin around the universe floating in midair. No, they were given some work to do in the world. And so those four relationships, when they're in their right place, the Bible describes that as shalom or peace, everything rightly 
related. Now you might say that doesn't really feel like life today. And you're right, because that's where Genesis 3, the fall comes in. Everything has been slightly damaged. It's not as broken as it possibly could be, but nothing is as it ought to be. So for example, we were born to relate to God, but we have failed to live as we should have done. No one would often guess the character of God from the way that you and I live. You know, we're often greedy and selfish and, and miserable or miserly, and, and that doesn't reflect who God is. So we've kind of broken our relationship with God. The Bible calls that sin. Uh, we live in a world now, don't we, which is full of broken relationships. And I don't just mean, you know, um, divorce and broken friendships. I mean, you know, we are facing all sorts of inequalities. The Black Lives Matter movement, for example, recognised that black people are often treated worse by the systems that our cultures have created. There's racial disparity. Um, we can see in our nation there's a massive gap between the haves and the have-nots. So you've got someone like Marcus Rashford campaigning for free school meals during the school holidays because some people are so poor that they can't even feed their children. And yet others are so rich that we're more likely to die of obesity than we are to die of hunger. And, and that can be amplified around the world. There's still a billion people who are part of the poorest group on the planet, surviving on just a pittance each day. 600,000 children around the world go to bed hungry each night. So we're living in a world of broken relationships. But we also have a, a, a climate emergency. So the way we relate to our environment is broken right now. And even with all the, the flights we've stopped having because of the lockdown, our planet's temperature is still rising. So we have a climate emergency. We've come out of, you know, we've become dislocated in our relationship to the planet. And uh, finally, our relationship with ourselves. Many people are just not comfortable in their own skin. They're not happy with who they are. Uh, they're not happy that they're the gender they are. They're not happy that they look the way they do. They're not happy about their relationship with food. Um, some people cut themselves just to help them feel something. All these broken um, relationships with ourselves are having huge impact. There's a mental health crisis going on, not just on university campuses, but around the country. And we are not at peace with who we are. So the Bible describes all of that, you know, that's not shalom, that's brokenness, that's injustice, that's sin, that's evil, that's not God's intention for humanity. God wants us to thrive and flourish, but we aren't, and therefore things are broken and dislocated. But the Bible also says that Jesus came into the world to fix that. He is the Prince of peace he's the one that brings shalom he is the peacemaker that comes to restore everything and jesus when he died on the cross he fixed or started the process to fix all of those relationships so we were far away from god because of our sin but jesus died on the cross in order that we could have our sins forgiven but it also says jesus says look um, as i have loved you love one another so that the same love that Jesus showed by dying on the cross is supposed to be the love that we show for other people, our physical neighbours, our moral neighbours, our families, the poor and the marginalised. All of those people matter to God. It's why I started my charity, Home for Good. And hey, let's just have a little bit of fun here. Um, there's a QR code right up there. And all you need to do is to, to take part in this little thing there'll be a little prize with this if you do it is to get your phone out right now put it on camera mode and then hold it up and point it at the qr code your phone will do something clever it will take you to a website and if you register with your name and address we'll keep you informed in how you can pray for home for goods work which is all about helping children who through no fault of themselves can't live with their birth parents and need alternative families. Jesus was so passionate about welcoming children. Let the little children come unto me. And, and he, he tapped into a whole stream of thought throughout the whole Bible where God is continually reminding us that he has special interest in the widow, the stranger and the orphan. 
And so Jesus is showing us that how we relate to other people and particularly the poor is a way in which we demonstrate our love for God. And so look, if you do that QR code thing, um, we'll send you an email if you're the winner and you will win. We'll pick someone at random or they may be predestined to copy this, The Greatest Secret, uh, which is my book all about why being adopted into God's family is the best thing that could ever happen to you and how it transforms everything, not just a relationship with God. So Jesus comes and he fixes our relationship with God the Father. He dies on the cross so we can be forgiven. Jesus dies on the cross and he shows us the kind of love that we're supposed to show to everybody we have opportunity to. And Jesus dies on the cross and he, he begins something of making the universe new. You know, we saw it in Jesus' ministry. You know, he feeds the hungry. He stills the storm. He's about putting the creation in its right relationship with himself and with human beings. And so as we care for the environment, we are showing our love for God. Look, today I'm, I'm alone in my house and I've just had, um, just had lunch. And how I leave the kitchen um, is a demonstration of my love for my family. If I leave it a complete mess when they get home from school or my wife comes home from uh, looking after our kids, um, she's, she's looking after them by taking them out to the beach today. Um, you know, how I leave the kitchen is a mark of my love for my family, isn't it? Because it's the environment that we share. And in the same way, how we care for the environment is a mark of how we love God who created this world and gave us opportunity to look after it. And Jesus came to fix our relationship with ourselves. I might not like how I look when I look at myself in the mirror. I could see more gray hairs coming. Uh, I could, you know, my, what is my skin doing? I'm brown and everyone else, you know, all the famous people are white. You know, I, I might not like how I look, but the Bible says God loves me so much that Jesus died on the cross for me. So I can't be complete junk. I can't be rubbish. I can't be nothing. I must be valuable at least to God. And therefore I need to start valuing myself. I need to start looking after the body that God has given me. I need to start making sure that I'm feeding myself. I'm educating myself. I'm, I'm, I'm caring for this body because it matters to God so much that Jesus died on the cross. Do you see how Jesus transforms all of our relationships, our relationship with him, uh, our relationship with others, our relationship with our environment and our relationship with ourselves. And when you read the end of the Bible, you know, Revelation chapter 21, there's this amazing picture. Please, if you get any time today, read it. It talks about John the prophet looking and seeing the heavenly Jerusalem coming down out of heaven to earth. And now the dwelling of God is with men, us humans. You know, God is going to come here. He, he's going to be with us. We're going to see him face to face, just like Adam and Eve did. And, you know, that's going to be a transformed relationship, us and God. But did you notice it was a city coming down out of heaven to earth? It's the heavenly Jerusalem. We're not living on our own. We're not just focusing on me and God. We're, we're, we're together. You know, he's going to transform our relationships with others. Did you notice it was the city was coming down from heaven to earth, making all things new? This place matters. Our relationship to the environment matters because God is restoring everything to as good as new uh, condition. And in Revelation 21, it says, God will wipe away every tear. There'll be no more sickness, no more death. And you think that's amazing. God's going to restore how we relate to our bodies, who we are, feeling comfortable in our own skin. God's going to fix that too. It's an amazing, amazing future hope that we have. And I want you to hold on to that incredible hope, no matter how hard lockdown is, no matter how hard your relationships are. Relationships can give us the most joy in life, but they can also cause us the most pain. And I want you to know that the Bible tells you how the story is going to end. Everything gets fixed. Shalom comes again. Everything gets restored. Broken relationships can be repaired and restored by the grace of God. It's possible. So hang on in there. These next laps that we're running, 
for this lockdown marathon, we will be okay because the God who designed the universe has promised how it's going to end and therefore we can hang on. I think our job now in this moment, in this difficult moment for the world, is to give people hope in all four of those relationships. We're supposed to be open about our faith, letting people know about the grace that Jesus has shown us. That's evangelism. We're supposed to be kind and merciful to our neighbours, moral neighbours and physical neighbours. We're supposed to do that in order to give people a taste of what's to come. And therefore, you might consider fostering adoption. You might consider a, a caring profession as part of your career development. You might consider volunteering in the food bank or the cat project or the Bristol noise or whatever it is you could do to show people the grace and mercy of God. It, we're going to give people hope by the way that we care for the environment. This is a climate emergency but we believe it's not complete disaster because God is in control. We need to play our part in caring and changing the systems, but we do it with hope in our hearts, not despair. And finally, we need to help people see themselves as God sees them. And that could be as simple as encouraging words, speaking truth and love and compassion into people's lives that they might have a taste of the grace of God right now. Friends, I'm longing for the days that we'll be face to face again, but in the meantime, let's hold on to the hope that our God is the God of peace and he's the God who can transform relationships. Thanks so much for listening. See you again soon.